third presentation will be Joy, who's going to uh, talk about her um, her engagement with architecture as someone who has a background in literature and uh, philosophy, uh, and she's going to go through some of the philosophical questions that uh, brought her to architecture. Uh, she'll talk about some thinkers and some ideas that she's uh, right now kind of uh, discovering and trying to develop, and I hope it'll give you a sense of uh, this difference of way of thinking about uh, architectural practice. Um, after Joy, Karen will really go through the development of a project she did as a student here at HKU. It's a project for a, rural, for a village in uh, rural China, a, a village redevelopment project, and I think there's a certain care and sensitivity to the project and it, it will allow you to see what it means to design and to think at the scale of a village of a community. Cal um, will then uh, discuss his uh, interest in cinema and talk about the relationship between, uh, for him, cinema and architecture and how his studies of cinema have uh, influenced in his uh, design practice. And finally, um, Tao Li Chi will uh, talk about his research looking at uh, different ways of measuring our environment and measuring the performance of architecture and different ways of using those um, uh, scientific uh, measurements or scientific parameters as the design tool. Um, so six very different approaches, six very different practices, and um, I hope that they will raise some um, questions for you about uh, what architectural practice can be, and uh, also that you have some uh, interesting discussions during your tutorials. So I'll be back with you uh, later in the class to discuss the assignment, your last assignment of the semester, and I will also have fun. So enjoy and see you next week. Okay, so um, basically a, an introduction to what we are going to present to you. So we have six sets of slides, and um, basically you have a, an overall understanding of what we are doing. It's, uh, so I'll start with the first set uh, with Kelvin, Alena, and Renu, and, and Mark. Okay, so um, would Calvin like to start first? Yes. So we we'll just hey, hello. Is it too loud? Hi, I'm Calvin. Uh, I'm. I have introduced myself to my class, but I have introduced myself to the bigger class. Um, I'm basically an um, architectural historian and designer. My uh, major research interests are modern architectural history and theory, urban design and conservation planning, and community design. So these look quite um, boring, but um, for, especially for those who are not from the, uh, the background of architecture. But um, I'm not going to bore you for the next 10 minutes um, because to my understanding, doing a historical research is like telling a story and trying to find out some meaning out of the story. So 
basically I'll tell you a story of my research. I hope it's not too boring. So, um, um, first one, my major uh, focus is historical research, and it is about the uh, public housing in Shanghai during the 1950s. Um, you can see these two happy girls uh, coming back from school in a newly built uh, public housing project in Shanghai called uh, Taoyang New Village in, 19, in the early 1950s. So I'm, gonna, I'm going to tell you about this story, about how they um, live a very happy, in quotation, happy life in, in, in this newly built um, uh, public housing estate. So I'll show you what is Shanghai before 1949. Shanghai was famous for being the Paris of the Eastern world. That, as you can see on the left, is the the, the bund. The um, uh, all these uh, uh, commercial houses are located, and you can see the the middle one is the uh, Nanjing Road, the most uh, famous commercial street in China. It it is still today, and then you can see this. Uh, very uh, fashionable girls in the 1930s who are uh, fascinating about fascinated about fashion and beautiful clothes, urban life, basically like you today. You enjoy makeups, enjoy buying clothes. That's the Shanghai we thought in 1949. But actually, we could look just uh, look around beyond this um, this uh, city center, but at the uh, periphery of the city, you'll see this this landscape, this urban landscape of uh, shanty towns, which means uh, a lot. Of, basically, uh, it's a fancier word for slums. Actually, Shanghai in the 1940s and 30s are surrounded by slums. So we can see this uh, disparity between the Actually, there are two worlds in Shanghai. One is this very uh, fashionable, very fancy world uh, about commercial development, about capitalism in Shanghai. Another phase is this uh, the underclass, that is uh, the underprivileged uh, class who um, live in very poor condition. Uh, they barely have a decent place to live in very bad hygienic um, situation. So. The worst situation is that that's this, um, this man, this a worker, living in Shanghai in the 1930s in this uh, very primitive hut. That's all he has, all he had for his whole life, living in this little, uh, I can call it house, it's just a hut, or even no hut. Um, so, um, the life in Chinatown is terrible. I think you cannot imagine, there's no sewage system, there's no, living room, there's no division of space inside the house. They just live, because to avoid this, um, this field on the ground, they need to uh, raise the, the whole house on top of the ground. So you can see, but under the ground there's a there's field, human, um, human waste, and also all the garbage they just throw on the field. And there's no, um, no any, there's not any, um, Public services, school, hospital, um, clinic, everything. There's none in this area. They just live a very primitive life, like cavemen in this uh, this hut made by uh, wood, sometimes uh, uh, straw. So um, as when I read into the archive in the 1930s, I read some. Um, horrible story. Like one in one of the shanty town, every morning this garbage um, collecting team, they would go to collect the garbage. They would collect five to six bodies of babies because the mortality rate for babies is very high. It's like an appalling story um, happening in in this uh, shanty town. So um, for in order to improve the situation of this. Um, the newly established uh, socialist government tried to, um, they invented a new system of, um, a new social system. It's called the work unit. They tried to, um, they, they, they thought the, the reason for the poor living condition of these workers 
was the exploitation of the uh, capitalist. This uh, uh, workers, uh, this factory owners, they didn't pay much for to the workers, and they exploit the value from employing them. So that's why the newly established government invented this um, interesting work unit uh, uh, system. It's a basic unit of the central economic plan. Everything, all the money from the government will channel directly to this uh, work unit within uh, a compound. Then all the resources will be channeled to this uh, entity. And this entity is responsible for all the aspects of the, the worker's life, including housing, um, public services, and also their livelihood, which means they work as a worker in this, uh, in this uh, work unit. So housing was an important part of it. So all this uh, needs, civil needs of the citizen of Shanghai will be provided by this single um, form of uh, organization. So that's what you see in the 19... Um, that's the solution to improve the life. Uh, but maybe because... Well, maybe now you see it's just not something very fancy, just a very small room, uh, but somehow surrounded by some greeneries. But if you compare this image with we, what we just saw in the Shanghai before 1949, you will see this is something uh, extraordinary and revolutionary for the, for the workers in the 1940s and 1950s. So, um, in order to ensure this, um, ensure this, um, this work unit organization uh, can be successfully implemented in this um, newly built uh, housing estate. All this estate was divided into um, some sort of hierarchy in in um, hierarchy. So uh, you can see that there are um, every sub village is organized surrounding a facility center, which provide all the social needs, uh, civic needs for for the residents living within, and. The, for um, there is an overall center for the whole village in in the middle, which provide um, other more um, significant social needs. For example, bank, uh, a bigger hospital instead of a clinic, a clinic, all the middle schools, maybe a community center for all these uh, activities. Um, so this would be the architectural structure. You can see how architecture become a tool to implement a social idea in order to solve the problem, some social problem we saw in, in, the, uh, in Shanghai before 1949. So in the city scale, they try to copy this um, arc, um, hierarchical structure in order to plan the whole city. Actually, you can see this. Um, Dark area is the uh, workers' new village in the 1980s. Actually, this uh, workers' new village formed the the periphery of the contemporary Shanghai. So they used this hierarchical structure and copied it in different um, area on the periphery of the city to develop a new city. So it becomes a new way of uh, urban development in 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 post-1949. So, but we have also to be more critical about um, this uh, project because it looks like um, it's like a, a perfect life. We, we talk about utopia that it, it's also a, a social utopia created by the socialist government to compare, to kind of uh, compare with the old society with the new society in order to legitimize their rule of the country. So actually, it, these photos look very fancy, but actually the life inside, there are still conflict, there are still people living in, uh, there's still um, corruption, there's still people living in a poor condition, because not all, this, all the housing looks like this. They are, uh, they are, the house is not up to this standard. There are worse housing, smaller housing, they, they have to share, uh, a public toilet, they have to share the kitchen, 
So it's not that rosy um, image you can see from these photos, but um, we have to also be critical about this. So um, that's about um, historical research about uh, of architecture. I hope you don't find it super boring, and I hope this would not discourage you in if you want to pursue an um, academic uh, career in the future. And also, I will go through very quickly about other engagement of, uh, of architecture. I have um, done some uh, exhibition for um, for housing, basically, and also for in infrastructure in um, in Hong Kong and in Shenzhen. This, um, the one on the left is the uh, Hong Kong Shenzhen Biennale in 2013. And this, um, the other one, on the right is a uh, quite recent one in 2017. We hold, we held an um, exhibition about it, the history of infrastructure development in Hong Kong in um, in the 1970s and 80s. Um, it was located in the, um, um, the City Gallery, a quite a big event. So um, as far um, exhibition is also another way of engagement in uh, discussion of architecture, apart from research. The third one is a design project. Um, basically, I'm interested in um, heritage conservation. Um, uh, mostly in China, I have done some uh, project uh, to renovate this historical site um, to uh, a modern function. Uh, for example, this is a renovation of uh, um, a house for a historical figure into a, a museum. And the one on the right is a mobile community um, improvement. Uh, you all know that a lot of family um, in Hong Kong live in the, in the subdivided houses, very poor condition. I work with uh, another architecture firm and um, NGO, so SoCo, uh, to improve their living condition by install uh, some sort of um, furniture to help them to sort out the uh, different uh, functions and try to improve the use and efficiency of use of space. That's something we hope we can um, change the life of the, some people by with architecture. I think that's it. Thank you. If you have questions, it's good to um, spend a little time to ask. Uh, we can do it afterwards. Yeah? So we'll show everybody's uh, work and then we'll do some Q&A. Uh, hi, um, my name is Vernon and this is Alana. And so we'll be talking about a project, research project we did in Chong Sawan. And I was wondering if anyone's from Chang Sao Wan here, or has lived there before, or have been to. <laughs> Anyone? Okay, don't worry. Um, so uh, Chang Sao Wan, Chang Sao Wan is used to be right next to the sea, next to the port, and so it became an industrial town. And but this was this is in the past, right? At the moment, um, like many old industrial towns in Kowloon, it has to be gentrified and it needs to be developed. And so we were uh, approached by a developer to do a research project to study Chang Sawan's existing condition and how it could be developed into a residential area. Um, so the research basically um the objective of our research is um, to focus on the streets um, to see how um, how it could be translated into um, a better place for um, living and shopping. Um, so these are the two streets that we focus on. Um, the middle street, uh, which is not highlighted, it uh, is the Cheng Sawan Road, and then um, the south street is Cheng Sun Road, North Street would actually extend to Tunwood and it's called Castle Peak Road. Um, this project is to analyze the importance of streets because uh, in Hong Kong 
Nowadays, um, a lot of street spaces are translated into driveways or for um, vehicular access, while for pedestrian use, um, a lot of these street spaces are uh, well have become elevated walkways or um, podiums. Um, so when we were doc using the street as the subjective of uh, subject of our research, we wanted to um, we did. The way that we documented the street was that we wanted to draw a plan of the street. And so this is one the this is the South Street. This is a plan drawing of the South Street that we produced. Um, from a distance you can only observe the uh, building blocks that we drew. So this plan is a plan of the ground floor, a figure ground plan. So it's all about where the building touches the ground, what is open to the public, and then um, from a distance, all you can really see is like, uh, as a pedestrian, all the spaces that you can access. So, um, so how we drew this uh, drawing was that we walked along each street um, many, many, many times, and then the way that we wanted uh, that we had to document it somehow so that we could take it back to the office and draw it out. So we used photography as one way. Um, as we were walking, we would take a lot of photographs um, and kind of. Uh, capture frames of the street, but uh, when we the first time after the site visit we went back, we found that this uh, method was very difficult to actually piece when we were trying to draw like a map and all the details like the paving, the shop front names. Like when you're on the paving, you can't actually see like the signage on the, the elevation of the buildings. So what we began to do as well was that we took. We began to take videos, and then the video would like kind of pan to the right, and then like keep walking, pan to the right. Um, disclaimer: We also use a lot of Google Maps. <laughs> it's very convenient. Um, this is actually um, documented in one to one fifty scale. Uh, this allows to uh, allows us to see how um, different elements of the roads and streets come together, but then. We late, later on we start to catalogue these um, into separate, like um, a dictionary uh, that allows us to look into these um, separate elements of the street and to analyse it, to uh, look at the rules um, or policies that govern these um, elements. So um, how we documented this is to uh, um, separate these into uh, moments and. And zooming in into one uh, scale one to fifty to allow us to see how these um, little elements of the street um, work together. Um, this particular moment focuses on the street detailing, um, which there's um, barricades. You you probably never notice how many types of barricades there are in Hong Kong. Uh, some are some appears to be more decorative and some are more practical in terms of um, providing a guide um, for sa well, safety guides so um, people don't get um, into the roads easily. And these are the manhole covers. Um, I think these are only the, for the drains, the um, sewers and uh, the, uh, for the storm water. Uh, they're, they're actually more like um, even like for fire surfaces and stuff. Um, also, uh, we began to notice that um, the textures of the wall also become important elements to guide the street experience. So uh, these are the different makeup of um, the wall textures, um, whether they were um, ceramic tiles or um, bricks or whatever. And we um, looked into how different um, textures are from different periods of um, time of the, uh, when, when the building was built. Um, so actually all these pages form part of a catalogue that we're trying to create of streets in Hong Kong. So we've picked out these categories that we think um, should be documented through time. Um, so for the second moment that we pulled out was about building footprint. As you can see from this image already, Changshan Street and Castle Peak Road have a very, very different uh, ground plane. 
So Chant, um, Castle Peak Road is um, very... Um, Castle Peak Road is actually on the left. But um, Castle Peak Road, as you can see, there's no uh, open connections. But on Chongsun Road on the right, there's actually a lot of uh, driveways that cut through the whole building. And this actually is a result of this width of building blocks. So on the south side, the building block is actually very narrow and it's only occupied by one building. So in this way, as well because they have an industrial pass, they, they were uh, all cut throughs that allowed for like loading zones for the, so the truck didn't have to U-turn. So the truck would just drive into the building, unload, and then would continue out into the next street. So as a result, all these, uh, the ground plane of the buildings are all open, just like the HSBC building. And then on the left is uh, Castle Peak Road, and because Castle Peak Road is actually very, um, on both sides the blocks are very wide, and there's two blocks of building occupying it. So this phenomenon doesn't occur. But what occurs instead is these kind of tiny passages that, cut, um, that the building is opened up to, for the public to walk through, and they become kind of shortcuts through the block. This is a page about like the figure ground, which kind of documents what I was just talking about. And then the next page is on driveways. There's also a shift in this kind of driveways or like parking. For um, these are all categorized um, by time basically. Uh, so the older ones, as I said before, are all cut throughs and loading bays when parking is kind of uh, secondary. Whereas the newer newer developments, because a lot of these buildings are already being torn down and uh, are being uh, redeveloped to a new height of 120 meters high, and so there's obviously. A, there becomes a greater need for parking. As well, the new programs are like offices, where, uh, offices and also residential. So this kind of new phenomenon of like these underground parking spaces is needed. So the driveway no longer cuts through, it becomes like a U-turn area, and it's all about these ramps that go underground or above ground into the corridor. The next page is about uh, talking about the corridors in Castle Peak Road. And what's special about these corridors is that it allows for like a commercialization to occur on the ground floor. So on the top left hand corner is like a s small arcade, it's like a loop. So you walk in and you view and then you come back out on exactly the same street. But what these kind of cut throughs do is um, they allow for like these very, very tiny shops to, um, to rent and uh, make business. So these used to be um, metal workshops because this building was like a metal factory and so now it's being converted into shops and like uh, takeaway shops as well. Um, and then another example would be the Hong Kong Industrial Center where it's again it's like this whole other city inside the building on the ground floor where all these kind of small passages allow for a lot of, lot of tiny shops to make business. And then moment three is talking about the setbacks. So if you walk on the street right now, this pathway is very, very narrow um, because the buildings were built right to the edge of the street. But actually, new, um, with new law in Hong Kong, a lot of the buildings have to be set back 7.5 meters from the center of the street. So here we kind of document the relationship between these new buildings and the old buildings in plan. So if you look, um, these new buildings completely step back and it creates these very strange open spaces suddenly as you're walking along the street. What we've noticed is a lot of these spaces are not occupied because with new regulation as well, a lot of these new buildings on the ground floor need like fire hydrants or like mechanical, um, mechanical equipment on the ground floor, so shops cannot occupy it. So what happens is just these empty deserts of space that doesn't really fit into like the existing landscape and isn't really being used. Oh, it's also like a safety requirement from like parking point of view because when cars are driving into parking, they have to, if there's a line, they have to stop somewhere. So that's also another reason why new buildings have to be set back. And then if, when we talk about paving, we also had to study like paving. And what we found is in Hong Kong, I don't know if you've noticed, but a lot of it is um, institute concrete poured, and there's a lot of strange patterns, like rectangular patterns. So what the history is behind these is actually because um, the very first pave, uh, pavement was using Institute Concrete, but when they needed to do underground works for like new uh, new internet lines, uh, electricity, water, 
or like fire hydrants, they needed to um, dig out, cut out these concrete pieces, and then once they were finished, they would have to, once they dug out the trench, as you see in the diagram, they would have to like cover it back, but they couldn't just pour it all with concrete. So what resulted in was these strange kind of rectangular patterns along the street. And in, in, since the 1980s, this has been changed because it's seen as not sustainable and it's also seen as a waste of time. So what they use is um, these prefabricated pre uh, con concrete tiles. So these concrete tiles they can remove easily and then replace as well. So um, even in the concrete tiles, there's a lot of like patterns that are being issued by the government. And so we tried to document these as well, all these patterns and the effects of how they link back to the concrete paper. Um, moment for street um, cavities. So um, these spaces um, exist uh, along the perimeter parameters of the building. Um, there are some some of these are entrances and some of these are like um, the fire escapes. So uh, basically, a lot of people start to occupy these spaces. And um, from here, this um, drawing documents the different types of usages of these spaces. Um, so uh, on elevation, some of these um, cavities you can see that, um, for example, um, the fire exit doors, uh, they, they are actually like, um, uh, they, well, um, they are set back and then people occupy them to take smoke breaks and then some people just sit there to um, text or wait for people and then some people um, even occupy these um, niches by um, parking um, their bicycles and then um, the last one was actually the most interesting one because um, this lady apparently occupies a few niches along the building and she is um, selling flowers um, in those niches so these um, small setbacks could actually um, become used for um, businesses um, and hawking so um, this one identifies the different um, informal activities um, on the site um, and then um, how we begin to document this is by um, cataloging how um, well, the time frame of um, these, um, well, these activities and um, some of them are actually like uh, very uh, mobile and some of them uh, from uh, at the top it's actually um, um, a hawker's centre for food and uh, it's permanent so uh, some of these are licensed and some of these are not and then um, entrances uh, because um, this is an important connection from street to a building block so uh, the entrances um, are kind of like a, well it governs the space um, between um, or the street and the building, and then um, a lot of these spaces are on ground level, and some of them because um, um, the well the buildings are incrementally um, changed by people, so a lot of these entrances began to um, or either become elevated or become sunken, and then some of these entrances are even like um, uh, well. Uh, like a shortcut that cuts through the building, um, which was... Um, and then this one, it's for the microclimate. <laughs> um, this one is the, um, that, that marks the intersection of the um, different buildings, so um, how these um, well, road junctions has a building surrounding it, and then uh, some of these buildings are um, cha has chamfered edges, so that means that the building edge is cut, and then uh, we started to wonder why this happens. It's usually because of the um, of the four meter requirement setback to ensure that the microclimate it's um, well it provides a better microclimate for pedestrians. And then vegetation, it's the greenery, the, um, the coverage required um, on a pedestrian street. Um, some of these exist in, um, as, a, as a form of like, planters on barricades, 
Uh, some of these are on pedestrian roads as a kind of a, well, a space for a greenery. And some of these are from uh, well, a, a wall covered by um, plants. And these are um, required for, uh, well, by different um, departments of Hong Kong that require this uh, greenery in order to um, make sure the pedestrian experience is, uh, is better. Um, so this is a short um, clip from, of our catalogue that we've produced. Um, I think the catalogue is very interesting in that it captures all these relationships of just two streets in Hong Kong, um, all the histories and all the um, kind of relationships that um, make these kind of specific moments in time. And so we've, the project will actually continue in Christmas because um, we've received funding to continue doing the research on even more streets in Hong Kong. So. Um, we hope you, you can have a renewed understanding of how um, streets also form part of the architecture and how it's very important. Thanks. Central. And um, 
one thing that uh, made me immediately know that I, I would really like this book was uh, the following quotes. The strength of postcolonialism, postcolonial theory, it seems to me, is that it effectively formulates the question of power dynamics as its narratives and consequently argues for other or different narratives. However, this might also be regarded as one of its weakness since it tends to ignore the question of technology, a question which, I would argue, cannot be reduced to one of narratives, since doing so involves acknowledging the material conditions without understanding ma the material significance of these conditions. Thus, the approach adopted here departs from that of the postcolonial critique in order to advance towards materials critique. This materialism is not one that opposes spirit and matter, though. Uh, one thing that I really like about Yoke's work is that he Explicitly, he doesn't reject postcolonial theory, but he advocates that we go beyond postcolonial theory by engaging with the material conditions of postcolonial theory. And uh, I think it, it brings very true in the context of Hong Kong, in which uh, a lot of the political discussions revolve around uh, localism, which sometimes have a fascist edge to it, and a lot of the times uh, postcolonialism. And there needs to be a new voice coming from uh, the critique of technology, especially from um, the uh, starting from the colonization of China from the British in the 19th century. Um, uh, let me expand a little bit on uh, his uh, notion of materialism first. He says that this materialism is not one that opposes spirit and matter, though. Uh, in, uh, in order to engage with uh, what he means by spirit and matter, I'd like to talk a little bit about uh, hylomorphism, which is the Aristotelian cosmological view that uh, the that uh, the world around us, the substance around us, is composed of form and matter, and there is like something that is substantial that we can hold, and that is material. But but does is that really true? Um, the, because in sciences we study nature as an object, and in, in a way that defines the notion of nature in the West as uh, something that uh, that could be studied, that uh, that presupposes a division between the object and the subject. But however, um, in, like, is it really true in uh, in the history of China? Did, is science really the opposition of uh, form and matter? And did people? really study things as their objects, or they really do, do they have a real like material basis, or is physics something that's different in China? Um, before I talk about that, um, I'd like to talk, uh, I'd like to bring you to mind the notion of the, the, the history of uh, 19th, 20th, 20th century China, in which uh, there was the Opium War, and China was colonized by the British, and by uh, by the British, and so there was the New Culture Movement that advocated that China, that the Chinese intellectuals engaged more with the scientific spirit, and to develop like a like a spirit of uh, technology that was not present in Chinese that history. And furthermore, in Chinese communism, there was also the notion of uh, that uh, Chinese, Chinese people have to have like a sort of technological progress that would uh, make them uh, developed in a way that would be superior than uh, the, the Brits and the Americans, which is obviously uh, speaking, speaking of today, uh, it is something that is becoming more and more true. But however, um, is China using, appropriating the concept of technology in the Western sense, or is it really, has it really achieved its goal of developing a notion of technology or, of, or a science that is very particular to its own uh, Chinese history? So, um, there is this uh, scholar who is called uh, Joseph Nihan. Uh I don't know whether you guys have heard of him, but his Chinese name is uh, Lei Yuasa. Um, he asked the question, uh, he tried to address the question in his uh, sixth volume book, Science and Civilization in China. Um, he tried to ask the question, uh, what were the inhibiting factors 
in the civilization that prevented the rise of modern science in Asia? Like, what are the factors in Chinese history and Chinese philosophy that have prevented the rise of science? And so uh, he tried to, uh, basically he would try to give the answer that there is uh, the, the notion of the, the Chinese philosophy, the Chinese notions of science is uh, very much um, organic and it's very different from the notion of science in, uh, in, in, in the Western sense. So uh, he said that, uh, so Yokoi in his book said that it is perhaps more correct to say that China was governed by moral laws which were also heavily, heavily principles and that law following Newton was understood in a white headed organistic sense by the new, new Confucian new Confucian school. Um, so uh, maybe like a background bi biographical note, uh, Whitehead is often is a philosopher, a British uh, British philosopher who is often associated with uh, thinkers like Deleuze, and uh, they uh, engage with uh, process philosophy, which is a sort of uh, philosophy that uh, talks about uh, that has a notion of intensities and becomings uh, in lieu of the notion of uh, substance. Um, so, uh, Yokoi talks about uh, the notion of Western technology in uh, his book, The, uh, the Question of uh, Cosmetics. Um, so, uh, for, uh, I think one very important point that might uh, illuminate the difference between uh, science in China and, and uh, science in, uh, in Western technology is that um, there is a very strong development of geometry in the West, uh, which is uh, absent. In China, and so um, with uh, so uh, Yoko was a student of Bernard Stiegler, who was also a uh, student of uh, Francois uh, Jean Francois Lyotard, and he's a Derridian. Um, uh, so one of the ideas that uh, Bernard Stiegler uh, used to talk about the notion of Western technology is that uh, in Plato's uh, book Meno, uh, he uh, I forgot whether it's, I think it's Socrates' slave, sorry. Uh, he told, uh, uh, I think someone asked uh, uh, Socrates uh, to show that there is truth. And so in, in order to show that there is truth, um, Socrates told his slave to solve a geometrical problem uh, uh, written on the sand. And so, uh, using, using a drawing on the sand. And so he sort of um, uh, gave rise to the idea of Geometry as something that is like your soul remembering, uh, uh, like your soul, like so there is some knowledge inherent in your soul that uh, enables you to solve the geometrical problem. And so, geometry is essential to Western science in that uh, astronomy is basically geometry projected into the skies, and therefore, a sense, uh, therefore, it forms a sort of Western uh, cosmology. And uh, he also uh, therefore, because um, uh, technology is, because geometry is like a form of soul knowledge that is externalized, um, Bernard Stiegler has this idea that uh, technology is a form of uh, mnemotechnics, which is a form of, memory is a form of technology in that uh, our, the, the things that we use, uh, like our phones, our different devices, our different ways that help us uh, remember things. And like writing is also another way of remembering things, and so um, therefore the idea that uh, the externalization of our organs of our memory uh, into something external uh, is uh, is a very important idea in the notion of Western technology. And um, another very big difference between Western technology and Chinese technology is that there is a very strong focus on the phenomenal world, uh, but not the noumenal world. Uh, Numina, the, the difference between noumena and phenomena is a, the Kantian idea that uh, the world is developed, the like things in the world is developed into something that can be sensed, which is phenomena. And noumena, which is something that uh, that you that uh, you cannot know. Um, on the other hand, um, Yokoi thinks that uh, Chinese cosmotechnics is more uh, slanted towards uh, trying to learn about the noumena. And so he he tries to substantiate on the work of Mao Zhong Mao Zhong which is uh, New Confucian 
um, and he was like one of the key members who was a part of the new Confucians in the CUHK, in the second generation of new Confucians who tried to articulate a notion of Chinese technology with, uh, uh, with Chinese philosophy. So his idea, he, um, Mo Dong San is a guy, like he had, like he studied uh, Kantian philosophy very thoroughly, thoroughly. Uh, Heidegger also, and he uh, knew, he was also very well versed in Taoism, uh, Buddhism, and also, um, yeah, Chinese philosophy. And he, he, he thinks that a Kant's noumena can be replaced by the notion of Xi in uh, Chinese philosophy, and uh, that uh, a Chinese ecology is somewhat, uh, like that, that, that the reason why there is no Chinese technology, there is no like Western technology, technological development as it is in China, is because uh, the Chinese philosophers have preoccupied themselves with trying to know about the things that one cannot uh, visually or essentially perceive, and therefore there is this, uh, there is not not such a strong like subject-object dis uh, distinction that allows the emergence of Western technology in China. And so uh, I would like to talk about uh, uh, Philip Descola's four ontologies. Uh, Philip Descola is an anthropologist, and he thinks that uh, animism, totemism, naturalism, and analogism are ways that uh, have structured uh, different people's uh, uh, conception of nature. And for example, animism is associated with uh, different tribes that identify themselves with animals as equals. Uh, totemism are uh, people's belief that like the that totems are somewhat have life, and animalism is uh, very much preeminent, uh, preeminently present in medieval England, where people believe in things like zodiac signs. Whereas uh, in Western technology, um, Cartesianism, which is related to naturalism, is what led to the development of uh, uh, Western technology, because that's the Western notion of nature that uh, was. Uh, caused by the division between the ob object and subject division. And nature, in a sense, is the object for which humans exploit and develop uh, Western technology through industrialization. And, uh, yeah, um, so one thing that would demonstrate a Chinese technology and how uh, the Chinese technical thinking differentiates itself from the West is that uh, in China, people think of uh, the landscape very differently than the West. Um, in, in the West, you like you have an object, but and you draw the, uh, the objects. But in China, there is this notion that uh, of of ping and hao yet, and that you need to express the Tao through the landscape, um, which is like a very like you can see that there is a very different way of relating to your environment as opposed to the Western. Uh, Western view of the universe, where the man is totally separated from the universe, and nature is an object which you can draw. Um, another thing that would demonstrate this uh, difference is the example of Pao Dai Pao Pao Ling Gao Hao. So Pao uh, Ling is like a very good uh, uh, dissector of cows, but according to him, it is not the mastery of skills that will lead to the perfection of the art of dissecting cows, nor having a very sharp knife. But in order to cut the cow, you have to understand the Tao and the cow in order to cut the uh, cow perfectly. And in order for the for the knife to cut, to cut through the cow, uh, uh, not without confronting the bones and the tendons. And this is why he did have to sharpen his knife, uh, even though uh, like for a very long time because he mastered the, uh, the Tao in the cup. So, um, what is Chinese cultural technics? Um, for Heidegger, uh, the notion of techne is not only uh, like techne in the scientific sense, but also it encapsulates the idea of craft and art, which we have just previously discussed in the notion of uh, landscape. So, art uh, can also be a form of technology. Um, so, um, so for a, cosmotechnics is a technology that articulates the ontology of cosmology. So in Western, uh, so Western technology is a cosmotechnics that articulates its ontology because uh, because it like it is uh, structured by the subject object. But what is the cosmotechnics of uh, of China? Um, so as opposed to the West. 
there is no very clear concept of nature in Chinese philosophy that separates man from the universe. Um, uh, you use an example of uh, the notion of ziran, like uh, in nature is often it is often translated as nature, but it also means the freedom to be. Um, so instead of naturalism, uh, Yoko makes a claim that Chinese cosmic techniques manifests itself uh, between Da and Qi, which is uh, way. Uh, I think you guys should uh, read the book because, uh, like this, these two concepts are like some concepts that have um, uh, ha has been very important in the history of Chinese philosophy and it articulates. Uh, the way of using uh, not really a tool, but the thing, the, like the way your practice manifests itself in something. Uh, so why should we care about uh, causal techniques? Is it only philosophy? Um, so uh, talking about a singularity and technological acceleration, um, Western technology has uh, led to a lot of uh, destruction. In, in the world, and it's leading, is accelerating climate change, and it's very important for us to develop an alternative notion or a different ontologies that will decelerate our uh, progress towards uh, uh, self-destruction. And therefore, it is very important to develop different causal techniques in order to uh, imagine a polarity of futures in which we do, we are not uh, we do not uh, come to apocalypse. And uh, so since uh, engaging with uh, Yuk's work, I have been uh, uh, also engaging with the work of Augustine Burke. Uh, he's, uh, um, uh, he is, uh, he's a guy who engages with the discipline of mythology. And what some of the very interesting things that he, he engages in with his work is through Japanese urbanism and how uh, Japanese urbanism is structured by different ontologies. <laughs> Uh, Western technology, and that's uh, um, the Japanese. Uh, like the, the notion of re like renewal is very different in like Japan. And if you've been to Japan, you know that like the, the Japanese people like to like knock their buildings down and re rebuild it uh, over a very short time. And the Isa Shrine is also like one of those examples where I think they um, it, like although it's a sacred place, they knock it down uh, every twenty years and. It, like the Japanese uh, urban landscape is almost maintained by ritual rather than by something that is very like concrete. Um, and also, uh, I've been also thinking about Bernard Stiegler's uh, notion of the Anthropocene, and he has this idea that uh, life itself is a, a negentropic force. Uh, negentropy is opposed to entropy, and in order to maintain life, therefore, uh, we, we should um, expend, like there's a way of dealing with energy uh, that is optimal and that isn't like recklessly expending it. Uh, and also, I've been uh, reading about uh, Richard Neutra's uh, survival through design, in which he talks about how, like, what is the way to build an environment that is um, that in which we like the, like that engages with like the importances of the environment uh, effectively? And um, I would like to read the first paragraph from the book because I think uh, if one were to construct like the best sentences that that has been written by architects, I think the first sentence of this book should be like in in one of the top ten lists. Nature has too long been outraged by the design of nose rings, corsets, and fouled air subways. Perhaps our mass fabricators of today have shown themselves particularly out of reach with nature. But ever since Sodom and Gomorrah, organic normalcy has been raked again and again by man, that super animal still struggling for its own balance. There have been mourners, prophets, great floods, and new beginnings. Thank you. <laughs> 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 
So we'll have a second video interlude uh, by your professor, Sonny. Okay. about the assignment for week six. Some of you may have already visited Taipun, the cultural center um, re renovated by Herzog and de Moron, opened about a year ago in Central. Um, a few of you might be writing about it as part of your final essay, but I wanted to make sure that all of you had a chance to go there and also um, think about it, look at the space, and try to understand and uh, reflect on how and if and why this cultural center uh, could change uh, how we think about heritage in Hong Kong. Uh, so the assignment, assignment six, um, is in the handout. And um, it's in some ways a two-part assignment. Uh, first, there's a small article by Edwin Heathcote, who is the architectural critic for the Financial Times. Uh, we've read some of his work already, um, but there's a very short, short essay from March 30th called From Cop Shop to Culture Hub, uh, where he talks about the renovation of Typhoon and some of the aspects of it uh, which he thinks are uh, surprising uh, for Hong Kong. So read the article um, and try to think about what uh, kinds of expectations it creates uh, about Typhoon and then visit. Um, Taekwun is open every day. Uh, sometimes they close parts of it for events, but um, it's free. Uh, you can um, go there during the day, go there in the evening, go there a couple times. Um, but go to Taekwun in Central, it's only about 15 minutes from here, and uh, spend some time uh, seeing what people are doing, seeing what kinds of activities are taking place, trying to figure out uh, what parts of the building are new, which parts are renovated, um, which parts were maintained as they were. Um, and then in a text of about 250 words, write about how um, your expectations um, for the cultural center were met or exceeded or maybe you were disappointed. Um, but what, what did you expect to find after reading uh, Edward Heathcote's article? And what are the what are the conclusions or what are the things that you take with you uh, after your visit? So there are a few questions um, to get you thinking on the assignment sheet, which again is your hand, in your handout. Uh, you can take photos as well if you like. Um, photos that you can include uh, in your, um, in your assignment. And there is one photo which is required, and that's a selfie of you at Typhoon uh, as a kind of uh, proof that you made it uh, over to Central to, to check out uh, the culture center. So that's due next week. I hope it'll give you a chance to explore a new place in Hong Kong and also to look at architecture um, in a way that lets you uh, use uh, what you've learned uh, this semester so far to think about uh, what's going on in this uh, new uh, cultural center in Hong Kong. All right, so uh, I think you're going to be taking a break now. I'll see you uh, next week and enjoy the last few presentations. Thanks. So we will take a five minutes break and then we'll be back uh, with Karen showing her work. So stay tuned. Don't, don't leave. So while you are taking a break, you can hand the assignment. If you have already prepared your assignment, you can give it to your TAs.
in the process of construction. All we need to do is have slots within the wooden columns and so beams just slide inside. So it's fast, easy, and convenient to construct. So now let's jump into the project that I have been doing. Um, uh, so the problem of this site is that there is some existing village furniture houses right there, as you can see in the previous photo. And uh, the uh, city government would like to build a new housing estate in the area to develop the site. And um, as you can see in the second plan, it's a proposal done by another Chinese architect called Tsui Tai. And he proposed to build some Parisian perimeter blocks in the area, which is uh, transferring some European style building in the area. And so I thought uh, we don't want to keep the existing village because it is already dilapidated. And I neither do I want to keep Tsui Tai's uh, perimeter block buildings because it is not really connected to the culture of Chinese history and the uh, uh, tradition of the area. And I thought, okay, it's possible to create different kinds of uh, planning in the area. Why don't we just throw a very generic plan, uh, like a generic grid that is composed of concrete slabs and um, buildings, uh, I mean slabs, slabs and columns. And so I have designed a generic grid onto the site by calibrating the um, scale of the existing funicular houses. And uh, as you can see uh, on the right hand side, uh, left hand side, is a plan that is overlapped with a generic grid. And so after that, I thought, um, how, to, how should I be combining these three mappings? And I thought, um, let's just overlap everything and see what is going to happen. And so on the left hand side is the superimposed plan, just literally overlaid with the layer of the existing village, and then the layer of uh, Tsukai's planning, and finally the generic grid that I have. And it's very messy at the moment, so I have to undergo a process of excavation, which means I have to delete the messy lines and uh, select important structures that I find interesting to keep and uh, also uh, things that I should erase in order to clean up the whole plan. So after a few testing, um, trial and errors, as you can see on the right hand side, uh, I've done a few sketches and then turned it into a digital drawing. And this is the resulted ground that I have made after doing the process of excavation. And so after overlapping, the order of the grid starts to be solved as you can see, and when it intersects with the existing building, it becomes fragmented parts, and remaining as notions of memory. And as you can see on the uh, pen, the green band uh, is the landscape um, that I'm going to put in the site, and it contains uh, some cultural activities that is going to happen in the landscape area, uh, which includes some foliage bridge, uh, uh, water lily ponds and reflection pools, which uh, echoes with the cultural activities that uh, happen among the Dongzhu people. And uh, here is the model that I have made, um, which consists of fragmented structures of the furniture houses combined with Tsuikai's uh, Parisian block structures and also the pillowcase, which means columns that I have added onto uh, the site. So the pillowcase have to uh, create free spaces to support the dynamics of the site. So after talking about the ground, then I have to do the real housing construction on the ground above. So having the grid of ground as the base, um, I have uh, extruded the grid into different levels, um, experimenting uh, this uh, folium uh, Volume kind of massing strategy by using the method of uh, drawing figure ground diagram on the top and also some basic kind of models uh, on the bottom. And uh, after several testing, the formal graded patterns start to collide with the organic vernacular pattern and generate unexpected spaces that enrich the urban experience. And the result of architecture recollects as a moment as a kind of the past or the present because. One, when one enters the site, 
they are not able to distinguish what is new and what is old. And this slide shows one of the typical plans on the housing above. As you can see, there are four giant halls which houses the elevator and the uh, staircases that are being anchored to the ground to support the generic architecture. And the regular order above contrasts with the intensity and the dynamics of the ground as you can see in the previous model. And uh, on, the slide, uh, on the bottom of the slide, it shows a section. So um, some fragmented, fragmented buildings are being left as voids to keep the stone like by keeping the stone wall envelope. And, uh, and while some of the vertical houses contain some catwalks that allow people to walk on top of the wooden roofs, giving a transitional experience when one moves from the old to the new. So whenever people have to enter the uh, new housing estate, they, have, they would have to uh, enter by passing through some of the old vertical houses. So after combining all the architectural themes that I've thought about, then it, it, I have to think about how it could be really constructive in reality. For example, um, uh, I have to think about the foundation, uh, the facade, and also some uh, building surfaces that has to be uh, assembled together with the housing that I've designed. And the exomometry drawing that uh, I've shown on the left is uh, is a drawing that shows how these things are being housed um, in the building. And then on the right is a sketch that I've made before um, making my model. Um, so before making the model, I have to show a sketch to my tutor so that um, if he approves that, then I could continue making my model. But like otherwise, uh, if he doesn't approve it, then I have to do it all over again. So it's like. Uh, you guys writing an essay proposal and submit to your tutor and ask for a proposal uh, uh, approval beforehand. So you don't have to waste uh, more energy and time and, and spending so much time working on another model. And here's a drawing depicting how the ground and the housing above is being combined. Uh, the green represents the landscape um, that I've designed, put onto the site, and the blue ones are the for Nicola houses that I'm going to keep, and the red ones are the people, and then on the above, the orange and yellow part is the housing estate. So after all, I have to overlay everything again to get that, and uh, that's the result uh, drawing that I've made. So uh, after spending a whole semester and you have seen the whole progress that I've done, and this is the only drawing that I have put onto my presentation panel in the end. So it looks kind of easy and simple, but it really did take a bit of energy and time. So I hope you guys really like it. Thank you very much. So, in, so I combine the two uh, things that I'm very interested in in my uh, Anfield study, which is the study of uh, these two filmmakers. And for my PhD, uh, I did it also in the architecture department. Um, it's called a theory of practice, okay, on architectural animation. So if you see a lot of um, animations for buildings, that's something that I have studied uh, in my PhD. Uh. So I basically got my degree in the uh, year of origin. That's a five years program in the States. And I came back to Hong Kong. Um, I practiced in um, a few firms, architectural firms. And then I started my uh, own um, 
small unit called uh, KG Lab. Basically, I do uh, interior design for clients. So I have about like um, less than 10 years of this uh, interior practice of designing. And then, uh, as you can see, this is some of the work that I do uh, for the apartments. This is in um, Thai, Thai Hang Road. And this is a very tiny apartment in, um, in Big Level. So you can um, go up to Facebook to check out some of the projects if you like. So I think last uh, uh, talk, um, I already show you my interest right now, um, which is in virtual reality. Um, especially using the game engine. Right? The game engine is a very powerful computing machine to um, visualize images for architecture. And well, probably this is why I'm in this class also, because uh, this class is about image, uh, space, and society. So I'm essentially more interested in the image or media of architecture instead of the real building. Right? How, uh, how space are being depicted by architects and animations. So that's why um, my thesis was the investigation of animation. Uh, specifically about architectural animation and basically is to find out how these animations can be improved right? because normally when you see animations it seems to go through the same track right? you move into the space and you're being introduced into a building you move through the rooms so I was talking to my professor and uh, we were asking the question how does this animation could be different right? So it allows me to, um, to investigate further into cinema, right? Because cinema has to have different, different te techniques, and I think architect can uh, borrow from those interesting techniques. Um, so I, in my MPhil, I study two filmmakers specifically, um, basically the works of Hitchcock and Antonioni. Antonioni is an Italian architect, uh, sorry, Italian filmmaker. Hitchcock is an American uh, filmmaker. Anybody have heard of them? So some of you have. Um, they are basically mid-century filmmakers, right? So they are 50, they, their work uh, encompassed about 50 years before you were born. But uh, that was a very crucial time when um, a lot's happening in, uh, in cinema. And those works actually affect um, how we see the world and, and some, a lot of architects. So I study their work and I propose in my end view that they are not only uh, filmmakers, right? They make films and like that, but um, they're actually space makers, right? So when you watch their film, uh, you are like going into their, their building. They create a kind of cinematic building and then you can go inside and then experience not only the story, but um, the kind of world that they created. So I propose in my thesis, uh, there is something called the space image, which uh, come into beings as we approach the, um, the millennium, because we have these different types of film being made now, and with digital, uh, and you know, with different kinds of equipment, and with CGs. So in my thesis, I propose there may be some uniqueness about the image that uh, Fimicus has produced. So we, I investigate the question, what is a space image, right? So in the thesis, uh, normally you try to define something, and you try to prove it, or you try to explain it uh, for people who don't understand what you're trying to do. So, um, so space image is the topics that I'm investigating here. Um, to put it simply, um, cinema and experience strategies that engage audience in the cinematic space. When you watch a film, you go into the story. So it's a kind of virtual cinematic space. And sometimes some of the films has the um, architecture as a character also. You know, it's not just the people or the dramas. Some of the films I investigate, I claim it that 
it's more spatial instead of dramas or story, uh, especially for the Hitchcock films and Antonioni, their films seem to be about something else, you know, instead of just the story. And usually their story creates this amazing landscape. So um, I look into that. These are the films that I um, investigate during my thesis. So as you can see, there are only um, seven films. Did some of you notice uh, some of the titles, maybe? Any of you seen uh, The Space Odyssey? It's 1968. It's supposed to be this uh, groundbreaking science fiction film. So the more recent one, um, it's The Matrix. Have you seen The Matrix? This is still not recent, right? It's already 10 years. So I concentrate in investigating these seven particular films to draw out some of the properties of what I call a space image. And of course, I can investigate more recent film, but I think the film in the past seems to provide a kind of distance uh, for more people to talk about them and to really understand what they really are. You know, so um, I think I think some of you have seen Akira. Right? Akira is an incredible manga film from. Okay, so I think most of you have missed quite a bit of cinema history. So hopefully next time when Sony will introduce you to more films. All right. So um, basically, this is what I'm doing now. Um, I'm um, teaching several courses here, especially Common Core course. So image, space, and society is. Right now, I'm doing and hope helping with uh, Sony. Another uh, virtu um, CC course is the virtual worlds, which I uh, investigate. And another um, called intelligent architecture, so it's also related to architecture. This was a class uh, I taught in a city um, in a CU, called City Management. Oh, so there's one other class also. So right now, um, besides teaching, I'm going into research interests. So besides doing the teaching, I think um, teachers like to further investigate what they have learned or what they have did in, in their thesis. So continue the interest. Um, I'm, I'm quite interested in this called open world gaming. Anybody playing video games? You know what open, game, open world gaming is? No one's played video game. Some of you, right? Okay. Uh, virtual space, which I demonstrated uh, last class. Something called spatial imaginaries. Uh, your imagination of certain place, right? It's more than the actual place. How we imagine those places is what I'm interested. And lastly, um, something called spatial cinema. So, <clears throat> besides that, I also make films. So, um, so these are all the films that I was attempting to make. Um, so if you are interested in some of them, um, you can go to this link. Okay. So in, by making film, um, I'm also interested in like, how the making process um, express the idea of uh, space, space image, and space cinema, which I'm doing research right now. Okay. Alright, so that's basically about me. Um, let me have Tao for his. strategies at the building and, and uh, I will be real quick because I know you guys are starving. So I will talk about the two research projects. The first one is in Singapore the, uh, and the second one is in Hong Kong. So the first topic is uh, learning space in Singapore. So that's what I'm doing when I'm doing a postdoc. And uh, I have developed, developed like two articles. The first one is talking about the ventilation strategies in the tropics, and the second one is talking about the semi outdoor space. 
So first, um, I have select like nine different sites on the campus of the US, and I divide these sites into three different types, and uh, air con space and the hybrid space, which means it is a combination of the air cons and the mechanical ventilation. And the last is the natural ventilated space. So as you can see from these diagrams, uh, you can see how many questionnaires we have been collected through the three years, and how many participants are involved um, in regard to the space types and the, the dates. So eventually we have received like more than 100 questionnaires. So among the three spaces, the aircon space, hybrid space, and the natural ventilated space, which space will receive the highest satisfaction? Assuming that most of you will see the aircon space, considering the Singapore is suffering a very hot weather conditions. But actually, let's just see the results. And uh, here is the thermal sensation loads, and you can see the majority of the respondents felt freezing cold, just like these rooms in the aircon space, and followed by the hybrid space and the natural ventilated space. And uh, as but surprisingly, we find that the thermal sensation, or thermal satisfaction in the hybrid space is even higher than the aircon space. And the, the overall thermal comfort also share the same trend. So, um, based on the collected data and uh, the received questionnaires, we can calculate the range of the ideal temperature in different kind of the space. As you can see, the temperature in the hybrid space is like five degrees higher than the aircon space, although it still received the highest uh, satisfaction votes. So we just uh, argue that the hybrid ventilation space can always achieve a better thermal comfort for the occupants, and we should like promote this kind of space instead of using the aircon all over the place. And uh, then I um, also developed another paper called the semi auto space in Singapore. So it's kind of very common space. And based on the existing literature, I choose these five design parameters, such as the orientation of the buildings, the height of the buildings, and uh, the distance with the surroundings, and the openings on the facade, and the void to solid ratios. So I just want to testify that which one of the parameters will have the profound influence to the satisfaction of the respondents. So again, I choose like five different spaces on the campus of the US. And uh, you can see the detailed information. And the red stand for the solid walls, and the green ones stand for the white space. So I find like five different places. And uh, for the regression analysis, I just put all the design parameters with the thermal sensation volts and the thermal environment. So eventually, I will get the conclusion that the, in a campus, the height of the space and the height of surroundings is a major factor to influence the satisfaction of the respondents. So enough for the Singapore, but let's take a look at the Hong Kong. Um, actually, um, the open three is talking about the privacy issues, and uh, the next is uh, talking about the legibility of the floor plans and the wind findings. Actually, there are two um, research articles with uh, size impact factors, and I already published online in case you are interested. Um, first is piracy. So my research is regarding to the elderly homes in Hong Kong. Then I choose like nine different places. And uh, you can see that this is a typical um, plants. And uh, the elderly homes are always at the podium levels of a high-rise residential buildings, the blue ones. And these are the pictures of the nine sites. They are all situated at the very high dense and uh, high-rise residential district. And then um, inside the elderly homes, they see the typical floor plans. As you can see, the bedrooms are all 
situated along the exterior walls and uh, the no areas in the very center of the floor plans. And I just do document all types of bedrooms, and uh, including the open space and uh, the um, solid uh, partition walls ar around the beds. So eventually I just proposed five different parameters which might have an influence um, to the privacy of the rest of respondents, such as uh, open space, uh, window to wall ratio, the height of the position walls, and the number of people per unit. And then I also get the data from the health status of the respondents, including the physical health and the mental health. So after the regression analysis, I was able to get all the data. For example, the ideal height of the partition wall should be around like 1.88 meters, and the, the uh, openness to solid ratio should be controlled around 0.5. And last, I will talk about the legibilities. So, as you can see, this is a typical floor plan in elderly homes in Hong Kong. So, um, there are hundreds of bedrooms squeezed in the limited space in Hong Kong, as you can see. So, when I'm in one of the elderly homes, sometimes I will also feel confusing because, because all the bedrooms are looks exactly the same and the aisles. So, um, not to mention the respond the residents who live in the elderly homes, I think most of them are suffering from the memory loss. So it's even harder for them. You can also imagine as if you are just standing at the uh, memorial of the Jewish in Berlin. So in that way, we can solve this problem as an architect. I just want to simplify the circulations on the, on the floor plans. So the method that I apply is called the Space scene test. It is a method to evaluate the legibility of the floor plans. As you can see, the red lines it stand for the high connectivities of the circulation, and the code lines stand for the low connectivities. So I just calculate all the floor plans in the CA homes that I um, selected, and I also link it back to the wayfinding satisfaction from the respondents and eventually I will get the results from the regression analysis and uh, the ideal integration value should be controlled around 0.9 so the integration level means the complexity of the circulations so eventually I uh, hope that I will give the reference for the future designs in architecture so that's all for the presentation and uh, I just hope that um, as an architect uh, we should have the responsibilities at least to seek the ideal solutions for the clients or for the residents or, um, or for the occupants and uh, we cannot just design something that out of the thin air but there must be some rationale some scientific base behind our design strategies so thank you If you like to ask questions, uh, maybe one or two, but if you want to ask questions in more details, I very encourage you to send us any email and then we can talk about it. Okay, so I think that's it for um, today's. Now, uh, just to remind you, our next week class is not here, alright? It's in CPD 1.24, alright? So, next class should be in the Centennial campus. Okay. Thank you for coming.
we have been watching a lot of films. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Just email me you know, if you have Thank more you. questions. Okay. See you. Yep, see you.